Welcome to the first uh, chapter in our course on advanced concrete technology. Uh, today we will be talking about cement production and uh, as I was indicating earlier, uh, I have also highlighted the sections from the textbook which have the relevant information. I hope that some of you have been able to procure the textbook already and uh, those of you who have not done so already, I hope that you will be getting it soon. Uh, so it will help if you read this uh, content before you come for class so that uh, you can participate actively and contribute to the class discussion. Uh, as I, I was indicating earlier, this textbook uh, has been written very well and uh, it is written in a language that is easy to understand without using too much uh, uh, very highly technical or research oriented jargon. It is probably uh, intended for a massive use as a textbook all over the world. So uh, the content that you find in these sections will be very relevant to what we will talk about in class. Okay? So without further ado, let us first talk about what were the binding materials that were used in the past. Now this is something that you know very well. Uh, most of our ancient heritage monuments, uh, if you think about them, uh, have different types of binders which are binding the different masonry units. Mostly a lot of our heritage monuments are in stone and brick and these masonry units were bound typically by binders which were based either with lime or some binders were based on gypsum and sometimes even bitumen has been used in the past uh, quite uh, significantly. And uh, in some cases, uh, the use of pozzolanic materials was, was also quite prevalent in the past. Now, of course, today we have very specific categories of pozzolans and how they are supposed to be used in concrete, how they are processed. There is a very clear cut understanding of how the system actually works. But in the past, people had used pozzolans quite inadvertently. For example, uh, in Greece and uh, Italy, uh, there were several examples of the use of uh, volcanic ash as an ingredient in the lime mortar. And, uh, the people who were using it found that the use of volcanic ash uh, gave the lime mortar very good properties in terms of improved strength and applicability and so on. So because of that, uh, there was inadvertent use of pozzolans in the past. But today, of course, when we look at, think about pozzolans, there are several different uh, pozzolans that come to our mind today. Uh, can you give me some examples of what type of pozzolans are there today? Silica fume, yeah. Fly ash. Rice is cash. Uh, one more uh, prominent type is calcined clay. Uh, we sometimes call it metakaolin. Slag, yeah, that slag is also a mineral admixture. But once we talk about cement composition and cement chemistry, you will learn that slag is not truly classified as a mineral admixture. It is more of a, uh, of a uh, alternative cement itself, alternative hydraulic cement. Okay? But these are pozzolanic materials that we commonly use today for most of our blended cements and also for concrete which contains mixtures of cement with these blending materials. Okay? Now, we have gone several steps beyond the use of these simplistic mortars because these were based primarily on uh, ingredients that were found and uh, could be obtained uh, in the form of engineering practice based on very minimal processing. For example, gypsum is naturally found also, you do not really need to process it. Uh, bitumen again naturally found, you do not need to process it. and uh, uh, lime based materials of course were derived from limestone. Limestone is calcium carbonate and when you burn calcium carbonate you remove carbon dioxide and get calcium oxide which is your quick lime which serves as a binding material. Right? So now this obviously was a precursor to the development of Portland cement and there are several people who have used different variations of cement in the past. Okay? Now one first name that comes to our mind is that of John Smeaton. Now, how many of you have heard uh, the name John Smeaton before? Some of you have heard John Smeaton. Okay, what was specific about John Smeaton? Apart from the fact that he built the Edison Lighthouse Tower, which is already there on the slide. So, no marks for that. So, what is special about John Smeaton? This is a quiz question. I mean, not the quiz in your, uh, what you write. This is a trivia quiz, basically. Okay. Yeah, John Smeaton. Any guesses? You were saying something? He coined the word Portland for the first time? No, no, no. that pretty. was a different person. Yes, pretty. A, uh, that was Aspen. Yes, I will come to him in the next slide. John Smeaton uh, was uh, essentially the first civil engineer. Why do we say he was the first civil engineer? He was the first prominent construction Okay. Uh, what is meant by civil? Which is not military. Which is not? Military. military. Exactly. So, he was the first non-military engineer to do building, to do building construction. That is why he was called the first civil engineer. Okay. 
So, he, he can be coined as a father of civil engineering, whatever that means. Anyway, so John Smeaton was the first civil engineer uh, because he was the first from non-military background to actually do building construction. So, he uh, planned the building of this Eddystone Lighthouse Tower in the 18th century and he discovered uh, by accident that he had different sources of lime to prepare his lime mortar and he found that the ones which had a large proportion of clay matter as an impurity, those were the ones which actually gave him the best properties as a lime mortar. So, again we know today that lime, uh, cement is a mixture of limestone and clay which is burnt together under very controlled conditions, but in the past uh, right from the 18th century people have been using some form or the other of cement. Okay? So, ultimately what John Smeaton did was used uh, this kind of a lime along with pozzolana in equal quantities to produce the lime mortar which is required for the Eddystone Lighthouse Tower. This is a photograph uh, of the Eddystone Lighthouse Tower, of course uh, this is no longer a, an active lighthouse tower but it is still a prominent national landmark in the UK because uh, it, 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 uh, it is in the memory of uh, John Smeaton. So, because of that uh, it is still a prominent landmark. Okay? Uh, there is a new lighthouse that was constructed about 100 years after this and uh, this entire lighthouse tower was moved stone by stone to uh, another location where it is still a, a major landmark. Okay? Anyway, so proceeding further what uh, were the steps that led to the development of Portland cement? We as somebody was saying uh, the person who first coined the term Portland that was actually Joseph Aston, but before him there were several other scientists who were working on different types of cement, okay? different types of uh, ingredients that were similar to what we commonly call today as cement. All right. So, now Vicat another name that you are all quite familiar with, where does Vicat come? In Vicat apparatus correct, you would have all used Vicat apparatus to determine some properties of cement like the consistency of the cement, the initial and final setting time and so on. Okay? Now, this Vicat was also a French scientist who in the laboratory developed an intimately calcine mixture of limestone and clay that was probably the first precursor to your Portland cement that we uh, know, uh, know it as today. Now, in the development of cement there are very many stages and researchers tend to classify these in terms of three different types. You have the proto Portland cement that means the first few variants that probably was associated with the work that was done by Vicat and probably Joseph Ashton in the beginning and then later meso that means uh, towards the beginning of the 20th century the kind of cement that started coming into prominence uh, uh, that was essentially by uh, attributed to William Ashton which who was Joseph's son. Okay? So, and he was the one who really pioneered the art of uh, modern cement manufacture and today we have a completely different product we call it modern Portland cement the requirements of cement have changed quite a bit in the last 100 years. Uh, now, what is the primary necessity from cement? No, of course, binding, even the past binding was the primary necessity, but w why is cement different today compared to the past? Because more C3S. Okay, more C3S, why? Because? Yeah, we, need we want faster, faster setting faster. and faster strength gain, primarily we want high early strength. So, most cements today are engineered to obtain a very high early strength. In the past it was not this case, I mean past people were willing to wait for a longer period of time for their structures to come up which is actually a very positive attribute, but today uh, we moved from the test match generation to the T20 generation, so we want everything quickly. So, while in the past people were willing to cure concrete for 28 days, uh, today we have curing done for 3 days probably no curing at all, people want the concrete to be ready right after it is poured. So, anyway so, uh, the upshot is that cement has undergone massive changes in the past uh, 100 years and because of that today it is a completely different kind of material. Okay? Now, of course, uh, you know this story quite well that uh, it was named Portland cement because once cement hardened and set after reacting with water, it uh, had an appearance which is similar to Portland limestone in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, it has got uh, nothing to do with the city of Portland it is actually some stone which is called Portland limestone in Dorset in uh, United Kingdom and based on that Joseph Ashton actually patented the name Portland cement. It is interesting to see that this patent even after nearly 200 years is still active although the patent has run out several years ago the name is still used. Right? If you go to somebody and try to sell them ordinary cement they will not buy it, but if you call it ordinary Portland cement then there is some mark of authority. Right? You say that okay, there is a Portland cement and you are trying to sell Portland cement. So, Portland cement is something which is actually having no meaning today because the term Portland is no longer valid. Right? The patent ran out several years ago. So, now it is just ordinary cement, but we still call it Portland cement because of the power of the brand 
okay. Again, a common example I give everybody is Xerox, right. Xerox was the name of the first, uh, one of the first companies that came up with the photocopying machine. But today I challenge you to find a Xerox machine in any of the photocopying shops. All you will find is some Japanese makes, Minolta, Sharp, Canon and so on. You will not find a Xerox machine anymore, okay. But we still use Xerox as a noun, as a, as a verb and everything possible, right. We say that I am going to Xerox these notes, okay. We do not say I am going to photocopy these notes. So that is again the power of branding. So the name Xerox stuck on for several years even after the machine actually ran out of, they, they stopped making any profits I guess. But today we still call it Portland cement and that is because of the patent that was there for several years and the name somehow stuck with uh, being associated with the quality of this material that is today produced in large quantities, okay. All right. So this was uh, work done by some researchers who tried to uh, figure out what was the original cement like, right. So they went to the kiln that was used by William Aspton for burning and uh, you can see that this is the type of kiln that was used. Uh, this is actually a, a, since this is a shaft which is quite similar to what we have for typical limestone kilns. So this is actually called a vertical shaft kiln. So you feed in the material at the bottom and it is getting heated and the carbon dioxide goes up from the top and ultimately you get a mixture, uh, you essentially get calcium oxide which is remnant or quick lime and this quick lime was again processed uh, probably with additions of several other uh, components to get your cement. Now of course uh, that the quick lime is obtained in a limestone kiln but in a cement kiln what uh, Abstin would have done is mix the limestone and clay together and fed in as charge and then heated for a certain amount of time after which the material was pulled out and then he would have obtained the Portland cement clinker from that, okay. So now you know that these kinds of kilns are no longer used. What type of kilns are used today? We use rotary kilns which are basically very large drums which are rotating at a very slow speed and the advantage of that is you feed in the material at one end, it comes out at the other end without the need for any additional energy input. And secondly, since it is a continuous process because the material comes in at one end, leaves at the other end so you can continuously keep feeding the material. In a vertical kiln like this, obviously you have to wait for entire burning to take place, remove your material from inside and then again have the next batch placed in. So the amount of material that you can produce in a vertical kiln is quite limited. And on the right you have this image of uh, microscopic image of the clinker that was collected, a sample of clinker that was actually collected by researchers from this kiln. Okay. And you can see from this that the kind of components that we see in modern cement are still there. A is basically A light or tricalcium silicate C3S, B is B light or dicalcium silicate C2S. Now there is a certain difference in the kind of A lights and B lights that are actually there. I will tell you later as to what the primary differences are in terms of the crystal sizes and the reactivities that was found in the older cement and how it is different from the modern cement, okay. So coming to that. How is the modern clinker different from what William Aspton first made in his vertical kiln, okay. So if you uh, compare different properties and composition, so this is what it looks like. The relative burning rate, that means the speed at which the burning happened, obviously that is going to be different for, for a vertical kiln versus the rotary kiln. In the case of the old clinker, the burning rate is quite slow because again the material is charged and then you have to wait for a certain period of time and then the material gets removed. In the modern clinker, the burning is rather quick because the, the entire time that the material spends inside the kiln is only 30 minutes. The material comes in at one end and goes out at the other and traverses the entire distance of the kiln that is nearly about 70, 60 to 70 meters sometimes in a matter of 30 minutes. So the burning is rather quick, okay. And because it is, uh, because the entire material is going through the same temperature phases, the burning is a lot more uniform in a rotary kiln. That is why you get much better burning in today's clinkers, okay. The size of the A light crystal that is C3S crystal in the clinker that was produced by Aston was nearly about 60 microns whereas today you get clinker sizes or A light sizes in clinker between 10 and 40 microns. What does it tell you about the reactivity? You get more reactive A light in modern cement clinkers, correct. On the other hand B light sizes were rather small in the previous clinker but today B light sizes are a little bit larger because the burning is a lot more uniform and complete as a result of which you get larger clink, uh, crystal sizes of B light. You will find later when we discuss cement chemistry 
that for the most part this component of belite remains unreacted in the first nearly 7 to 28 days of hydration. Only very long term hydration tends to react this belite that is actually available because it is a very slowly reacting material. Okay? And again we will relate that to the kind of crystalline shape and the impurities that are available in belite which cause it to have rather a low reactivity. Okay? The cooling rate once again in the past you had to actually remove it from the vertical kiln, allow it to cool naturally. But today we have specialized clinker coolers about which we will learn later in this chapter which, were, which are used to actually cool the clinker that comes out of the kiln because of which you can actually get a very rapid cooling rate. Okay? Uh, a certain form of C2S or B light alpha C2S which is one of the polymorphs of B light is found in modern clinkers but it was not there in the older clinkers. Okay? And of course, uh, the kiln as we already discussed is the vertical or beehive kiln in the past and today we use the rotary kiln because of its greater efficiency and uh, uh, much higher output as compared to the vertical kilns. Okay? All right, so let us now come to the production of Portland cement. Before we discuss the individual steps of production, I want you to realize these things. One is Portland cement is an unusual industrial product which is produced in huge quantities in special plants that can produce nothing else. And uh, do you know how much cement is produced around the world on a yearly basis, annual basis? Any idea? Any guesses? Sorry? Any number? Throw out some number, do not worry. It may be right. No, you are talking about the uh, effect of cement production, yeah. but how much cement is actually produced? Relative to that, you can. <laughs> I do not think you can back calculate. No. So, how much cement is produced? Any any numbers? How many million tons? 1000, 400, 200, all over the place. All wrong. It is more than 4000 million tons. Okay. The amount of cement produced in the world is around 4000 million tons or even more, out of which nearly 35 to 40 percent is produced in China. Right. And like everything, India is second to China in cement production, <laughs> India is second to China in cement production, India is the second largest producer of cement in the world and we produce, we have an installed capacity of nearly 300 million tons, but our cur current production is probably about 260 or so. Okay? We produce 260 million tons a year. Uh, of course, much of the cement is used within the country, we are also exporting cement to several other countries. And somebody was raising an important point that cement production contributes to nearly 7 to 8 percent of uh, carbon dioxide emissions around the world. Why? After it is burnt, uh, 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 calcium oxide. Yeah, obviously, because the primary uh, raw material for cement manufacture is calcium carbonate. When you are burning this calcium carbonate, the carbon dioxide goes out. So, for every ton of calcium carbonate that is burnt, around 400 kilograms equivalent of uh, carbon dioxide actually goes out in the atmosphere. But apart from this, you also are burning fuels. Okay? Some of these are coal based fuels. Right? Some of these are other alternative fuels, but overall because of burning of fuels also there is additional charge of carbon dioxide that goes on in, into the atmosphere. So, it is estimated that for every ton of clinker that is produced an equivalent of 1 ton of carbon dioxide goes out into the atmosphere. So, you can imagine the kind of uh, impact cement production has on the carbon dioxide emissions that is why it is leading to about 7 to 8 percent. And overall I think the building industry itself is contributing to nearly 20 percent of CO2 emissions around the world. That is because not just cement, the other components of uh, uh, concrete production like aggregate, uh, aggregate crushing, aggregate production and then your transportation of the concrete, the job site activities that relate to building construction, all those involve the consumption of energy. So, when energy is consumed obviously, that accounts for some burning and this burning also accounts for CO2 emissions. So, there is a large amount of emissions that goes out from the construction industry and the maximum part of that is from cement production. Okay? So, today there is a major emphasis on not just LC3, but uh, technologies that can reduce the amount of cement that is used in concrete to produce a given quality of the concrete. Okay? So, coming back to this perspective that cement is produced in plants that can produce nothing else. The product is produced by a combination of unusual unit operations involving mining, very fine scale blending of raw materials 
very high temperature clinkering reactions. We have temperatures of nearly 1500 degrees Celsius which is reached during this process of clinkering. Controlled cooling, grinding, blending and finally shipping under controlled conditions and all this has to be done keeping in mind that the chemical composition should be very maintained in a very narrow range. Okay. The tonnages are huge, we, did, we just discussed 4000 million tons around the world and you still have to do this with the kind of quality control that produces chemical composition which is within a very narrow range okay. because then you do not want variability to happen with cement. right? Typical plant costs are very high, I mean this is probably a number from several years ago 250 million dollars but I am sure that today this number must have doubled. Okay. The plant must also produce continuously to pay off capital costs because it is a very large investment. So, if you do not produce uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, you are not going to be able to maintain the cement plant or pay off the uh, loans that you would have taken to actually build these cement plants. Three shifts per day and uh, again if you stop the kiln operation for even one shift, the problem is your material variability will increase. Okay. If you have the kiln running continuously, you will have the same level of uh, 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 composition uh, or rather the uh, range of compositions will be very kept to very constrained and narrow ranges if you are able to operate the kiln continuously. The moment you stop operating it and restart it, it will take a long time before you can actually come back to your regular cement production. Okay. So, again you need to do it on a continuous basis 3 shifts per day and there are several environmental constraints also because you know that there is CO2 emission first of all. But since you are burning different types of fuels, there are also other emissions, SOX and NOX, right? You must have heard about different forms of sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides, and these are also emitted into the atmosphere. And depending on where you are in the world, the constraints could be very stringent or probably somewhat less stringent, but nevertheless, they are very much there, and you need to ensure that you are keeping these things in control while you are doing your burning of the, uh, the raw materials inside the kiln, okay. All this must be done to produce a commodity product that sells for 6 to 8 rupees a kilogram. Okay, we get I think our 50 kilogram cement bag is about 390 rupees. Okay, in, uh, interesting uh, question again, why 50 kilograms? Why, why is the cement bag weighing 50 kilograms? Easy to handle. Easy to handle. I will try handling 50 kilograms. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, la for labor it is easy to handle, <laughs> <laughs> believe me it is not, one person lifting 50 kilograms can be a back breaking exercise, even two people lifting it can be a fairly difficult one, why 50 kilograms? The equivalent cement bag weight in the United States where they use uh, still an archaic old system of units, pounds, it is 94 pounds. Okay. Ours is not as bad, 50 kilograms, we are not using 46 kilograms, conversion of 94 pounds. Why 50? Some some basic thing must be there, right? Why is it 50? I think the uh, cement content per meter cube should be 300 or 350. No, that depends on the so mix design, that depends on the mix design and today we are doing mix design mostly by way batching. So, does that give you some idea? Why 50 kilograms? Because in the past volume, 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 volume batching volume was batching. used yeah. and if you go to several sites where volume batching is still done, you find this cubicle looking bucket that they use to measure the ingredients. If you fill up one cement bag, it will exactly fill that bucket. So, it is approximately 1 cubic foot, right? that bucket is approximately 1 cubic foot and that 1 cubic foot is filled up by about 50 kilograms of cement. So, instead of measuring cement in the bucket, they can now put bags directly in volumetric batching. So, in volumetric batching you have proportions like 1 is to 1 is to 3, 1 is to 2 is to 4 and so on, right. So, in that case only the sand and stone need to be measured with this volumetric bucket, the cement they can directly use as bags. So, that is the advantage of having this 50 kilogram bag, okay. Now, if you read the standards carefully, cement can also be packed in other uh, weights, but then they want to maximize the, uh, the, the amount of packing so that they can minimize on the transport costs of the cement. Uh, apart from bags of course, you know that cement is also available in bulkers, right? when it is uh, supposed to be transported in uh, huge tonnages, especially to ready mix concrete plants and so on, you, they obviously have to send it in bulkers. Right? Bags are still preferred for trade construction, for regular construction in the market, but for large construction infrastructure, 
where they can set up their own silos to handle the cement obviously they will be getting it in bulkers okay. So all this is done at a cost which is significantly low okay less than bottled water okay. So imagine the kind of constraints and the kind of uh, 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 operations that go on the cement plant how well they need to be controlled. So coming to the raw materials for cement production uh, we know that the primary raw material is the same that was pre previously used for lime that is calcium carbonate okay. So it is essentially a calcareous material it need not be just uh, the limestone it could be other forms of calcium carbonate which have certain impurities also I will talk about that in just a minute. Uh, the source of your lime may also have some impurities in the form of iron and alumina okay it is not going to be entirely purely limestone. Then you have a clay material or argillaceous material which has primarily a source of silica and alumina because clay is basically aluminosilicate right clay is aluminosilicate. Now if you think about it uh, about 80 percent or more of your cement is essentially limestone 80 percent or more of the raw material for cement is actually limestone. The clay is only a very minor component which may even be present as an impurity within the limestone itself because when you do mining of limestone there is obviously clay to be found as an overburden or between layers of limestone. Okay, how is limestone formed? Any idea? How is calcium carbonate formed? It is a sedimentary rock, but sediments from where? From where? Where are these sediments coming from? What are these sediments? Calcitic sediments. So, most commonly found where? Skeletons. Skeletons of? Shelled organisms typically, yeah? shelled organisms, sea creatures mostly, right. So, because of the weight of the sea water on top, the shelled organisms which died basically, the sediments started breaking and recompacting under pressure, okay. And these layers probably would have formed over hundreds of millions of years, okay. So, if you visit the limestone quarry, you will see that there are distinct layers of deposition. So, each layer of deposition is one geological event, okay. And what will happen is after that layer of deposition you might find a layer of clay which may have been the overburden during that time okay or sand or other things which are mixed the soil which was mixed okay. So it is a very interesting scenario I will show you some pictures later on when we actually move to the segment on aggregates okay. So limestone so concrete even though we are using it today is also a very historic material right because we are obtaining the raw materials from materials that were existing millions of years ago or materials that were formed millions of years ago. So we are even when you are not dealing with uh, stone when you are making cement or aggregate also you are dealing with extremely old material and this is being processed to make something totally new okay. Uh, gypsum is another raw material that is used in cement manufacture and it is added in the final stages of cement manufacture as a set regulator. We will talk about how this affects the cement chemistry and it does a major effect on cement chemistry and today uh, if you look at the standards for ordinary Portland cement okay, anybody knows the number for the standard anybody has referred the standard for Portland cement 269 is the correct number but have you referred the standard no okay you should refer make sure that you do refer to uh, these standards because ultimately a lot of the uh, properties of cement are uh, are uh, very clearly given in these standards you need to understand and and understand the implications on actual concrete mix design also. Okay, so 269 IS 269 is the standard that pertains to Portland cement and you will see that it allows you up to 5 percent of a material called a performance improver. So any cement that you buy today is not purely Portland cement okay the Portland cement may have up to 5 percent of a performance improver. So 269 is for cutting grade. No today the new 269 covers all grades of cement the uh, the older one was 33 grade and 12269 was uh, 53 grade but today 269 covers the modified 269 covers all grades correct. So uh, up to 5 percent of your cement you are allowed to put in a performance improver and the most common performance improver that cement companies like to put is limestone itself. So all you do is same instead of processing your limestone take your raw material limestone and grind it along with the cement clinker to produce the cement up to 5 percent can be used. Instead of limestone if fly ash is available that is also a good performance improver. Now why is it called a performance improver what performance is it improving sorry durability, durability. well it is questionable we do not know whether it is increasing durability or not 5 percent of fly ash may or may not do anything but what is it doing 
What performance is it improving? Microstructure. 5%. It's a hard sell to think about 5% improving anything. What is this? Reduces the energy which is required. Exactly. So essentially you are improving your performance by reducing the energy and the costs, right? Your ground limestone is ground and simply added to the cement. You are not burning it anymore. So, 5 percent of your energy is reduced. Fly ash which is collected from thermal power plants is already a waste or a byproduct. You do not have to process it further, you can directly use it as 5 percent replacement for the cement clinker. So, that is where you are reducing your energy and cost and that is why these are called performance improvers. Of course, they may marginally improve performance. For example, the ground limestone which we will learn later can also have a reactive side to it like what is there in LC3 or limestone calcium clay cement, we will talk about that later. Uh, there may be some marginal improvement in properties, some may be workability, may be strength, may be durability, but essentially these performance improvers are intended to cut down the net energy emission and the cost from the production of the cement. And today there is a new cement coming in which is called Portland limestone cement. Of course, in India it is new. But in the western countries, Portland limestone cement has already been there for several years. Okay. Portland limestone cement will have up to 15 percent of the clinker replaced by ground limestone, up to 15 percent. So, again the, uh, the uh, idea is the same that we want to reduce the amount of energy required to produce a single ton of cement right? by replacing material that has to be burnt at very high temperatures with something that is directly ground, it does not need to be burnt at all. Okay. So, that is a major reason why we want to shift towards Portland limestone cements. And of course, because of the other issues involved with cement production, very high CO2 emissions, we want to shift increasingly to blended cements. So, we will talk about blended cements in the, in the later parts of this uh, chapter also. Okay, so, what are the sources of these raw materials? There are different types of carbonate materials available on the earth's crust. Okay. The most common ones that are used are limestone. Marl, marl basically is a limestone deposit with a high fraction of clay minerals. Okay. Marl is a very interesting material because uh, it, it gives you a fairly high quantity of clay also along with the limestone. So, you do not really need additional clay to produce your cement. Okay. Then you have calcite and aragonite which may be available in the natural mineral form itself. And you have shale, seashells directly, cement kiln dust. The dust that comes out of the cement kiln which is not collected as cement, the, the lighter part that flies out that can still be collected and that can be a raw material for the next cycle of cement production also. Okay. Silicon you are getting it from clay, marl, sand, shale, fly ash, rhysis cash or slag. So, these are some alternative sources of silicon that may be added to get the desired proportion of silicon dioxide in your system. Okay. Aluminum is coming obviously from the clay and from other forms of clay and shale and fly ash and maybe sometimes aluminum ore. If your clay does not have sufficient quantity of aluminum to contribute, you may want to get it from aluminum ore itself. Iron again from different forms of uh, uh, impurities in clay, otherwise you may need to add iron ore, mill scale, blast furnace dust and so on to increase the content of iron to the desired limits. Okay. Now, this is the simplest schematic depiction of a cement production process. Uh, it is it's not that complicated as it looks, uh, there are too many activities here, but we will further refine it by looking at each activity separately. But overall, this is what is happening, you have your cement uh, limestone quarry here, the excavation of the limestone is done and it is brought to the crushing unit. There is some primary crushing that goes on to, to reduce the particle size or to reduce the large boulders into small stone sizes. And this primary crushing leads to rough ground limestone that is ground through a secondary crusher that leads to a fine ground limestone. Now, why do we want to grind the raw material? It is going to easily blend and burn. Okay. It is going to easily blend with the other raw materials and burn in the kiln when you reduce the particle size. Right. So, then we have temporary uh, storage spaces, silos and so on where we have other materials also like sand and clay which may be added to get the desired composition. Right. And these are again sent to a grinding mill to ensure that they are ground to very fine particle sizes to improve the blending and burning capabilities. Then all these are sent together to what is called a preheater tower. Okay, the idea of a preheater is to try and remove any moisture that may be there in the raw materials because all these raw materials are getting naturally mined. Right? 
So, there is obviously moisture that is coming in, this moisture has to be driven out. If you want to drive everything out in the kiln process, it may be a very difficult uh, thing to do because the kiln has a certain limited length and if most of that length is spent in trying to drive out the moisture, you will not get an efficient formation of cement. So, in most cases before the kiln operation, you have the preheating tower okay, which is basically preheating or subjecting all the raw materials to a heat of about close to 7 to 800 degrees Celsius and from this preheater the material is then coming into the kiln. So, this is the uh, typical layout of the kiln where the uh, fuel source or the burning source is at the lower end of the kiln and the material comes in at the higher end. So, since the kiln is rotating the material that comes in at the higher end simply moves by gravity to the lower end and since the fuel source is on the lower end the temperature gradually increases from the input end to the output end okay. and the material that comes out of the kiln goes through what is called the clinker cooler. Okay. Now, please remember that this material is coming out at very high temperatures 1500 degrees Celsius, you are cooling it down to almost normal temperatures or close to about 100 degrees Celsius. So, the remaining heat is still something that can be utilized for further production processes. So, this heat is actually captured from this cooling process and recycled into the preheater tower. Okay. There is a lot of heat recycling that goes on there to ensure that you are not losing all this energy that heat recycling actually en enables supply of heat for preheating once again. Okay. So, beyond the clinker cooling the material is then proportioned with gypsum in the final stages and sent to the grinding equipment. In the past people were using ball mills, but today there are more efficient grinding units available. So, anyway this is the picture of a ball mill. Once again ball mill is quite simple, it is a rotating cylinder which has very heavy steel balls inside. So, you put in your cement clinker and gypsum, the steel balls collide and impact against each other crushing the cement clinker and gypsum together in the process. So, you are crushing and blending at the same time okay, inside the, the ball mill and from here it goes into a proportion uh, uh, sorry into the storage temporary storage from there it goes into the packing facility to be sent out either in bags or in drums or in uh, bulkers or whatever the case may be. Okay. So, this is the overall layout of the cement production process. This is again a schematic depiction of this process which tells you the same uh, essential things. You have the limestone quarrying followed by crushing and grinding, the preheating and then the rotary kiln. Now, it turns out that in the past uh, there was also an alternative process used that was called the wet process. Okay. Now, this was used when the raw material which was sourced from the natural mines had a very high content of water inside. So, supposing your raw material is so wet that nearly 20 percent of it is water, then uh, probably this preheating may not be efficient in removing that water entirely and then your kiln burning may not be uh, as efficient as you want it to be. So, what you would like to do in that case is simply add extra water and blend the raw materials as a slurry okay, and then send the entire material into the kiln directly. But the problem obviously is that majority of the length of the kiln will now be used to drive off the water. Okay, it will be used to drive off the water. So, because of that the wet process kilns that we used in the past were nearly 100 meters long. Uh, today with the help of a pre calcine or a preheater, the kiln lens, uh, lens have actually come down to nearly 30 to 40 meters. So, significant reduction and since that is the most massive piece of equipment in your cement plant, the capital cost associated with the kiln will be the highest. Okay. So, people have increasingly moved to combination of the preheaters with the dry process kilns and nobody uses a wet process anymore barring a few plants that have not really shifted to these. In India, I do not even know if there are any wet process kilns available. I think most of the kilns are dry process kilns. So, again from the rotary kiln, the material is coming to cooling, storage of clinker, then final grinding where all the additives come into the cement and then cement silos for dispatching. I okay. will just walk you through a cement plant layout just to show you all these operations from an actual cement plant for those of you who have not been to cement plants. Okay. So, this is from a cement plant in Chhattisgarh uh, which is owned by Lafarge. Of course, in the past it was Lafarge, now Lafarge has been sold off to a company called Nuvoco. Okay. The new name of Lafarge in India is Nuvoco. Okay. There is no longer Lafarge cement available in India. So, this is actually the limestone stacking yard. You see here the limestone stacking yard. On the right of this image, you see the limestone stacked. There are several conveyors which are bringing the limestone from the quarry or from the uh, 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 delivery unit to the limestone stacking yard. Okay. From the stacking yard, this limestone will go towards the crushing unit. 
and this is the conveyor which is taking the limestone from the stacking yard towards the crushing unit. The next picture shows a crusher, a typical crusher, okay. Again uh, from the crusher, the material is stored in a temporary silo, okay. And there will be other temporary silos for other raw materials which you want to add during this process. Now I, I do not know how clear this image is, this image is that of a preheater tower, okay. Why is it called a preheater tower? Because there are several uh, preheater modules connected to one another vertically, okay. So, you can see that this, uh, this is nearly 8 to 9 stories high and there will be at least 6 to 7 preheaters connected in series to one another. So, that the material gets thoroughly preheated, all the moisture is removed and in fact, today we even use it as a precalciner. So, not just preheating, precalcining that means we are able to burn off a significant quantity of your limestone in the preheater itself. So, that further brings down the necessity for large energy input into the kiln and you can still reduce the length of the kiln further. So, it is called a precalciner when you are actually having a fuel source also inside the preheater which tends to remove the carbon dioxide from the limestone quite effectively. Nearly 60, 70, probably even 80 percent of limestone gets decarbonated or carbon dioxide gets removed and then this material comes to the kiln, you can reduce further the size of the kiln, right. So, from the preheater tower, the material is coming to rotary kiln. But of course, you see two different tubes here. The rotary kiln is here on this side, okay. This tube here is the heat recovery tube which is actually taking the heat from the cooling process back into the preheater. You see it is uh, sloping the other way. So, from the preheater, the kiln has to slope in this direction. So, this is the kiln which is sloping in this direction. I will have a clearer picture of the kiln. So, this is the rotary kiln here, okay. That is your rotary kiln and this is the heat recycling tube that is actually taking up the extra heat and conveying it back to the preheater tower. So, the rotary kiln please re remember it is a very long cylinder nearly 40 meters in most dry process plants if not more, okay. And uh, what you also have to imagine is it is made with steel and steel cannot withstand extremely high temperatures, right. What is the temperature range up to which steel can be okay? 600 probably 5 to 600 degrees Celsius beyond that it cannot withstand that heat, right. So, what you have to do is line the interior of the kiln with heat resistant bricks, okay. Typically heat resistant bricks are used to line the interior and sometimes you can use special cements like calcium aluminate cement which are extremely good against very high heats, okay. So, you are lining the interior of the kiln with these heat resistant bricks. Different types of heat resistant bricks are used in different segments of the kiln depending upon the temperatures that may be experienced in the kiln, okay. So, this is your ro rotary kiln. The other end of the rotary kiln is where the fuel source is located. So, again this is the picture from the left side. So, that is your preheated tower, that is the rotary kiln. You can see that the slope is very gentle, okay. The slope is extremely gentle because the material should come in at a fairly controlled speed, okay. And at this end that is at the lower end of the kiln is the fuel source. I will show you a picture, yeah. This is the fuel source and that is where the burning is actually occurring at this end of the kiln, all right. The operations are very well controlled. Today it is a completely con computer controlled process. There is no manual input anywhere. Everything is perfectly controlled and most Indian cement plants are probably state of the art plants because they were set up uh, towards uh, 80s and 90s only and we have the best equipment possible in most of our cement plants. Okay, this is the clinker that is coming out of the cooler. You can see the clinker looks like a very nodular almost like an aggregate, right? And that is basically your clinker which is fused together at the high temperatures and after cooling it comes out like nodules, okay. This nodular clinker is then sent to the ball mill, okay. After temporary storage it is sent to the ball mill. In the ball mill you have the other additives that go in are added, either uh, you add your gypsum anyway then you may be adding fly ash or limestone as a performance improver. And supposing you are producing other types of cement like Portland uh, uh, porcelain cement PPC, in that case a larger quantity of fly ash will go in. If you are producing Portland slag cement, larger quantity of slag will actually go into this grinding unit to grind all the materials together. It is not just grinding, it is also intermixing all the materials properly, okay. So, the material then comes out and is stored in the silos and finally uh, dispatched. Okay. Now, we will talk now about the individual processes and what are the 
uh, challenges involved in these processes. You know that the first important process is the pulverization of the raw material. Okay. The feedstock or the raw material should be pulverized to the right size again as you rightly said for proper blending and burning of this material. So, and if you are reducing the size it reduces the overall power consumption to get a certain quality of your cement. Okay. There is definitely better burning and blending possible with reduced size of material and what size do you really want? The typical desired size is that you want a residue of 1 percent on the 200 micron sieve and 12 percent on the 90 micron sieve. That means most of your material is between 200 microns and 90 microns. So, that is the particle size range that you are grinding it down to. Okay. You remember that uh, during quarrying you are actually getting the limestone in very large boulders. Some of these boulders may be even a meter in size and you are actually then crushing it down to just a few microns, okay. uh, only 100 microns or so in average size. One more thing I want you to uh, remember is that uh, not all of the limestone that is mined is suitable for cement manufacture, not all of the limestone. In fact, uh, it is estimated that nearly 60 percent or probably even 70 percent of the limestone that is actually mined is not useful for cement manufacture because it has got way too high an impurity content. Okay. So, the overall net charge of calcium oxide that is possible from the limestone may be limited because of that large chunk of a limestone is not usable. So, if you go to a cement plant you will see these mountains of the waste material that happens anywhere no? wherever mining is there we produce mountains of overburden we produce mountains of material that is not distinctly usable. Again clay mines are a lot more uh, drastic in that regard because only very high grade clay, very white clay is sought after by the paints industries and ceramic industries. All the other clay which contains a lot of iron impurities that is just junked. Okay. All this material simply lies as waste. So, any mining produces a lot of wastage and same thing happens with limestone mining for cement manufacture. Much of this limestone is not utilizable. Okay. So, what we have to ensure is we know what to do with this kind of waste also and this is something again that we will talk about later when we look at blending materials for cement manufacture. Now, there are certain equipment I am not going to go through how these work. Uh, you can find enough information on these different types of equipment are involved for crushing. You have jaw crushers, roll crushers, hammer and impact crushers, gyratory crushers, ball mills, roller presses. And then of course, you have classifiers to ensure that you are classifying the smaller particles and the larger particles. So, that the smaller particles can be taken forward in the process. The larger particles that are there need to be fed back into the grinding system and then sent back to this process. Okay. All right. So, we will stop with this for today because we are out of time and continue our discussion on the other processes of cement manufacture tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Okay.